أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المنومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي يا ربنا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة العمى يا غريب يا مذنوب يا عدشان كربلاء ما خال من تمسك بكم وأمين من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقولك الحق ولا استغفر قائمين عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقالوا ما لهذا الرسول يأكل الطعام ويمشي في الأسواق لولا أنزل إليه ملك فيكون معه نذيرا أمنا بالله صدق الله العليم العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the whole of the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them, have emphasized on numerous occasions the importance of community and communal gatherings like this one. We're taught, for instance, about the blessing that takes place when we eat together, when we speak together, when we spend time with one, with one another, when we go and we visit one another. In a tradition from the Messenger السلام, he states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no space and there is no moment when worship of God has reached its peak and reached its climax, like when believers spend time with one another and help one another. And when we talk about community within the Islamic context, we have this term known as Ummah. And we state in the dua, Alhamdulillah, alladhi ja'alani min ummati Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi All thanks and all praise is due to God, who has allowed for me to be from amongst the members of the community, of the greatest of leaders and the greatest of creation, <laughs> that is the Messenger of God. When we talk about this idea of community then, it's important to understand that at the foundation of it is the Messenger And thus that our responsibilities in terms of cultivating this community also have to be taken from the instruction and from the divine teachings of the Messenger And I'll try to keep this discussion brief for this evening, but as you can all expect, it will be done in three different dimensions. <laughs> the first dimension is in terms of taking a look at the salient features of the community of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Secondly, in terms of reflecting upon a tradition in which the Prophet, alayhi salam, speaks about the right of your fellow community members. And thirdly, in terms of thinking about the future of our communities as we take inspiration from the Messenger So firstly then, what are those salient features of the community of the Messenger First of all, before we get into these qualities, it's important to note and important to understand that the Prophet is a personality who digs people from darkness and into light, who takes them out of ignorance and into knowledge. That the Prophet through his charisma, through his etiquette, through his words, through his teachings, through his behavior, through the beauty of his face, was a mechanism, was a tool which allowed for so many people to feel influence and for and to allow for so many people to feel a sense of belonging. And if we're not striving in our very best effort toward emanating those sorts of qualities toward the people around us, then we're not stepping or walking in the footsteps of the Messenger of God, Muhammad And again, at the end of the day, what is all of this ritual about? 
the tears and the beating of the chest and the poetry and the black and the food and so on and so forth. What is it about except to revitalize the teachings of the Prophet and his family in a way that we want to resemble their actions? It's meant to be a reminder that cultivates us so that we're starting to take the next steps. And when we come and we take a look at those CLD features of the prophetic community, we see the first aspect of the community of the Prophet of God, alayhi salatu wasalam, was the accessibility of leadership. Was the accessibility of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, himself. The fact that he was there to answer people's questions. He was there to spend time with individuals. And that anyone and everyone, especially during the early days when the Messenger, alayhi salam, was in Mecca, that allowed for them to enter into Islam and become Muslims was because the Prophet ﷺ would take the time in order to teach them, in order to demonstrate them the reality and the depths of the teaching of this religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse of the whole Quran, chapter 25, verse 7 that I began with, he states, وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَابَ الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ التَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ that the people of Mecca, they would say that how come God sent down a human being who's exactly like us? How could he be a prophet? How could he be a messenger? If he was a messenger, he should be an angel. He should be someone who flies. He should be someone who has special powers. He should be someone who can communicate with the jinn. People ask me, Chef, do you see jinn? I said, oh, I just told you guys the other day. They said, but no, you said that some people can see jinn, but you're sheikh, so you have to be able to see the jinn. I said, no, man, I'm just a regular guy like you. Every time I look in the mirror, I see a jinn. <laughs> the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, people were critical of him because he was too accessible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes the people of Mecca. When he says, And they would say, Who is this messenger? He's not a messenger. He eats food. Messengers don't eat food. Sheikhs don't eat food. They drink smoothies. And he walks in the marketplace with us. He doesn't fly in the sky. He talks to us, he communicates with us, he engages with us. How could it be? The Prophet ﷺ was trying to teach something so unique. And that was that he was so accessible. And that a quality of a leader of a community, and the quality of a believer toward their fellow brethren, was to making sure that they always offer a space where those individuals feel welcome whereby they always speak toward the importance of accessibility toward leadership. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali alayhi salatu was salam, when he writes the letter toward Malik and Ashra, he tells Malik and Ashra, make sure that when you take the position of the governorship of Egypt, which of course he never got because he was killed by Ma'awi before that, he says, when you take that position, know one thing, and that you have to be accessible to the people in the way that they love you and in the way that they adore you. When I was leaving the Islamic seminary, the Holy City of Kepara when I was studying, my very last day before I left Kepara, I went to go and visit my teacher, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Daqya Qudarasi, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Muhammad. I told him, give me some advice before I go home. He gave me a whole lot of advice, spoke to me for a really long time. And then he said, and the most important thing that you have to do when you go back toward your community, when you go back home, is you have to make the people love you. And I said, I'm such a lovable person. <laughs> How could they not love me? And he said, be serious, actually, I never told him that, I'm just serious. <laughs> he said, make sure the people love you. I said, exactly how you do that? How am I supposed to do that? He said, go talk to them. Go and communicate with them. And then he told me this verse of Allah. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
He tells the Prophet Ali Salam, or he quotes the people of Mecca who are disrespecting the Prophet Ali Salam by saying, how can he be a prophet when he eats with them and he walks in the marketplace with them? In another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if he had sent down an angel toward the community, what would people said? He's not like us, why would we follow him? In other words, people sometimes they just don't want to believe. We just don't want to follow. But what we do have to understand is that the first most critical quality of the prophetic community of, of our messenger وسلم, was accessibility. Was the ability to demonstrate that he was there for anyone and everyone. You do not need to be in a position of leadership also to understand this. Every single one of us has something to give. Every single one of us has a skill. Every single one of us can give a smile to the person who's sitting next to us. Every single one of us can ask the person next to us how they're doing. It doesn't require that much. And I've said this a couple of nights ago, and I'll say it again. We have been breathing together for seven days in honor of Abi Abdullah and Hussein, alayhi salatu wa salam, in the sacred gathering of the Majlis, of the grandson of the Messenger of God. Peace and blessings be upon him. We've been sitting down with the same people for the last week. How many of them do you know? How many of them did you meet this year that you didn't know last year? I honestly don't know half of the people in the room right now. And that's my fault. Because we used to have dinner afterwards. That would meet people in Medjula. I can do excuses. <laughs> I may just sit down and eat with people. We don't have that opportunity anymore. So I said it like I told you guys last time. Invite me over for dinner. No worries. Anytime. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is create a door of access to allow for people to know who you are, to spend time with you. Because again, community is that important. The second salient feature of the prophetic community of the Messenger is this idea or this notion of compassionate listening. The Prophet وسلم, when you picture a leader, when you picture a prophet, when you picture anyone who's the head of state, and that's what the Prophet وسلم, was for 11 years in the holy city of Medina, where there were millions of people under his authority, and under his rule, and like that of Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was in Kufa, when one third of the world as we know it today was under his authority. They would sit down and they would not speak all the time. They would not lecture, but they would be ready to hear what others have to say. You know, when you start and you ask that question, how are you doing? How is it going? How are you feeling? When someone actually starts to tell you how they're feeling, it means that no one in a really long time asks them in a way that's sincere, how are you doing? Because no one is going to come and talk about their issues to a stranger or for someone that they've spent only a week with grieving. You have to do it with someone you're comfortable with. But we don't create many time in our communities, culturally, for whatever reason, an opportunity for people to go and actually speak to their issues, to are speaking through their challenges, to are talking about their obstacles. So the Prophet والسلام, in Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9 of the whole Quran, it also states another way that the people of Mecca were critical of the Prophet. The first way is they would say, that how can he be a Prophet when he eats our food and when he walks in the marketplace with us? He's too accessible. The second critique that the people of Mecca had about the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would say, who are Ohonun, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, that one of the ways that the people of Mecca would annoy the Prophet is that they would say, who are Ohonun, that he's an ear. In other words, he's all ears. In other words, all he does is listen. If he's a leader, you should get up on the pulpit and tell us what to do. But all he does is want to hear other people's problems. Is that a problem? Is that a bad quality about somebody? No. It's something that we look for, it's something that we need, it's something that we are always seeking. They were, tr- were critical of the Messenger of God, alayhi salatu wa salam, because he would listen attentively, because he would listen compassionately. And sometimes all people want is for someone to listen to them. You think of this example before? Many times that people, they come to make an appointment, sit in my office, and they say, I have something going on and I'd like to talk about it. I said, sure. The point I run for 50 minutes, an hour. And for that hour, I'm, I've never said anything. They're talking, they're speaking about their issue, they're crying, they're weeping, they're grieving. And I'm saying, Allah bless you, Allah give you patience, I'm sorry to hear that, blah, 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 whatever it is that I do. 
But they say, we'll do that at all. <laughs> and at the end of the conversation, they're like, thank you so much. You've done so much for me. You've changed my life. I said, seriously, for the last hour, I've done nothing except for nod and say yes, and I'm sorry, and I wish you could be more helpful. They said, no, you have no idea what you meant for me. Why? Because sometimes people, they just want someone to listen to them. And the Prophet ﷺ, again, he creates that opportunity. The second CLE feature of the Messenger ﷺ's community is that not only he was there to listen to others, but he worked toward cultivating that environment amongst the members of his community. And thirdly and finally is that it was a community, again, that embraced all people. It embraced people with different backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, as well as different lenses and different spectrums of their religiosity. When someone comes to the Majlis of Hussein ibn Ali ibn Adabad ibn Ali salatu wasalam, who am I, or who are you, or who is anyone of us to say that this person doesn't deserve to be in the Majlis of Hussein Ali ibn salatu wasalam? They're coming to the Majlis of Malik Hussein, this is your Majlis? They're coming here to take an emanation of the light from the grandson of the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon them, and then we have the right to pass a judgment and an audacity to state that they don't belong with us because we've been doing this for a lot longer than they have. It is said that one day Imam Sadaq he took a group of people he took a group of people from Medina who were going toward Karbara to going to going to visit Imam Hussein Salam Allah. And as they're on their way toward going to visit Imam Hussein they were in the out and they were in the outskirts of the holy city of Karbara. And as they were on the outskirts of the city of Kabra, the Imam Ali Salam told his companions, he said, go to that village and invite them to come with me. Tell them that I'm going for it. Is Yara Imam saying? I want you to tell them that they should come with me. That I'm inviting them and we can all make this journey together. So his companions just show up, whatever you say, Imam, you're our master. So they went toward that village. A few moments later, they came back, but with none of the people from that village. The Imam Ali Salam said, What are you doing? I gave you one task to go into a village, invite them to come, so that we can all make ziyarah of my grandfather and say together. They said, Oh Imam Abdullah, Oh Imam Salam, that when we went in there, we saw them and they're not like us. He said, really? He said that they don't know how to do wudu properly, they're kind of dirty. I don't think that they're, you know, I don't think that we can really hang out with them. We're good. I like our group. I'm comfortable. The Imam Ali Salatu Salam, you know what he responds? He says, Imagine if we, meaning Ahl Bayt, if we judge you the same way that you judge them. Think about that for a second. Imagine if Ali ibn Abu Talib, Imam al Mushtaba, Imam al Hussein Ali Salam, he looked at me, he looked into my heart, and he saw my sins, and he saw my vice, and he saw my transgressions. Would he ever accept me? The Imam Ali Salaam says, Imagine if we judge you the same way that you judge other people. We're in trouble. If we do that, or if we end up in that situation, we're in trouble. So again, the third feature of the Messenger Ali Salaam's community is that it was a place that again had unique entry points and access points for all people, regardless of their religious spectrum of, or where they are, in terms of their engagement with spirituality. And that brings me again to the second dimension. I'm going to run through this really, really quickly. I know that this night has been really long. But there's a tradition from the Prophet والسلام, in which he has outlined for us the rights of the believer. And I'll just run through a couple of them, though there are 30, and we could actually dissect every single one of them in a lot of detail. The Messenger ﷺ states that the Muslim ala ahihi falahuna haqqa that for the believer, for the Muslim, that upon his believing brother or believing sister, there are 30 rights that he or she has over him. And one by one he goes through them, he states, an yaghfur zallata wa yarham ibrato wa yastur awrato. I'll read a couple of them, he states that the first quality of the Believer, or the first right of the believers over one another, number one, is that they forgive one another's mistakes. 
is that they forgive one another's mistakes, meaning that we let some things pass. Number one, that we allow for our believing brothers and sisters, when they make a mistake, we don't call them out on it. The Prophet ﷺ continues. It's number one, that you forgive your brother's mistakes. Number two, console him during hard times. Number three, hide his faults. Number four, dismiss his pitfalls. Number five, accept his apology. Number six, defend him amongst those who backbite him or her. Someone is talking smack about one of your friends or one of your community members, why you, why you don't defend them? In public, we defend people. We defend our own. We stand by our brothers and sisters in, in, in our faith. The Imam or the, or the Prophet والسلام, continues. He states, amongst the rights of fellow believers one, one another is that when they get sick, you visit them. That when they die, you go and you attend their funeral. That when they're going through difficulties, you're the first to arrive at their door towards supporting them in difficulty. That when they lose their property, you go and you find it for them. And he even states something is seemingly insignificant, is that when your believing brother or sister sneezes, you say, Ya Allah, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on If you go through one by one, every single one of these details, as mentioned by the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, in terms of our responsibilities toward our brothers and sisters in faith, we have to go back and reflect and really try to understand where are we at this spectrum? <coughs> are we really people who have that sense of care and compassion and love and mercy for those around us? Or are we people who just say it's not that important? Going back to where that narration that I mentioned at the beginning, that there is no way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a worship in the same way as when a brother goes and supports his brother, or a sister goes and supports their sister in religion, out of their love for their faith and out of their love for their church. That's some deep stuff right there. It's something very simple. We learned from when we were a kid that the Muslim community, for instance, is like one body, that famous tradition of the Prophet Salam. When one part of the body feels pain, the entire body feels pain. What are we doing when we take a look at the issue of like the Muslim world today, kind of where it's at. How many of us remember them in du'a every single day? I talk to myself first before anyone else. And then how many of us know that those around us might be going through this, might be going through something? They'll start doing this work. When I came back from the Islamic seminary four or five years ago, and probably more so, they started working over here at the Islamic Center. I realized that people go through a lot of things. As he mentioned earlier, this amazing community has raised more than or close to a million dollars in supporting the center or in, 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 in terms of building out a center that supports survivors of domestic violence, women and children. Raised close to $950,000. Out of the individuals who come and see me on a week to week or a month to month basis, 70% probably of the individuals who come and see me are women who have relationship issues and who are survivors of one variation or another domestic violence within our community. Um, think about that for a second. Where is the light? Where are we pulling people out of darkness? Where are we walking the footsteps of the Messenger of God, Ali Salaam Jum Salam, who are coming again to the support of those who are at us? And I'll conclude with this last point, and then I'll move toward that which we're over here for. The third dimension in regards to thinking about kind of where our community is going to be tomorrow. The Prophet ﷺ did not keep this message so that we only contain it within our walls. It doesn't mean that we go and start proselytizing to the streets. It doesn't mean that we need to go and ask everyone to convert to the religion of Islam. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we take a sense of inspiration from these days. We take a sense of inspiration from Ahlul Bayt. We take a sense of inspiration from the Prophet and his Immaculate family, peace and blessings be upon them. And it's important that we carry out the values, that of justice, and that of love, and that of community, and that of patience, and that of generosity, and that of making a difference in this world that so desperately needs it after these nights, and creating the institutions that we need after these nights. The Mejlis is 45 minutes, is one hour, is two hours, is three hours. It's 10 days, or 40 days, or 50 days. 
We take inspiration that the ritual doesn't cultivate a sense of spiritual in the heart. And if the ritual doesn't if the ritual doesn't cultivate a sense of difference outside, then we're not doing anything. Then we're keeping the message in these four walls. And we do what it is that we have to do. And next year, yes, we're going to be a larger crowd. But we're going to do the same exact things we did this year. And we're not going to grow. And there's no growth. And if there's no progress. And if there's no difference. And if there's no change. And if there's no revolution. Then what is it so about? We'll talk more tomorrow night. For today is the night. That's far more important than anything else that we discussed in the last two hours or so. For it is the night in which we recollect the tragedy of a man who represented the community of Hussein, who represented the Ummah of Hussein, Sallallahu Imam Hussein alayhi salam had no one in those last moments on the Temple of Haram. But one of those individuals who he did have, in spite of everything that he had lost, and that allowed for him to have a sense of solace, that I have a sense of support, is his brother Ali Fadl Abbas. Wa ma adraka ma'in Abbas. You know, from when we're children, we hear the story of Ali Fadl Abbas. And we hear charisma, and we hear bravery, and we hear courage. And you picture this man, the giant. And for those of you who have been to this holy shrine in the city of Kabbalah, you go and you stand in front of it. And I remember the first time when I, I bore witness for the blessed mausoleum of Ali Fadl Abbas, alayhi salam, and I looked at it, and I remembered myself when I was a kid, pretending like I'm Ali Fadl Abbas. And you think about everything that he stood for in the tent of Muharram. And you allow for your imagination to take you to this man's legendary station and status, the brother of Hussein, but not only the brother of Hussein. He was the flag bearer of Hussein. He was the caretaker of Hussein. He was the uncle of Hussein. And Abu Fadl al-Abbas, one of his titles is Bab al-Hawaj, the door to desire. You ask through the intercession of Abu Fadl al-Abbas, and you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. Why did God give him that ability? Because he was the door of desires for the children of Hussein alayhi salam. And even though he wasn't able to serve his purpose in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him hands in paradise to keep on giving. In the time of Muharram, all of the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam had been killed. And Abdul Fadl Abbas, he goes toward Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he says, Oh my dear brother, now is that moment, allow for me to go and fight. And Imam Hussein says, No, you are not permitted to fight. He says, Allah oh, Abdullah, why do you say that? He said, all of your companions have been killed. I am here, I am your brother, and I need to give my life in your way. To which the Imam alayhi salam said, no, you are the flag bearer of my army. You are the caretaker of Zainab. My daughter is Sakaina, she looks up to you. I have no way that I can allow for you to fight. I'll leave you with this tragic line. You know what Abu Fadl Abbas responds to Imam alayhi salam? He says, oh, Allah Abdullah, you said that I am the flag bearer of the army. What army, O oh Allah? Do you know? He said, it's only you and I. Everyone else has been killed. Ali al Akbar has been killed. Qasim has been killed. At this moment, he says, oh Allah, Abdullah, say you be your own Allah. Please give me permission. At that moment, Imam al Hussein, he looks toward the eyes of Abu Fadl al Abbas. His eyes that had been a flaming kind of in it. He was ready to defend the Imam alayhi salam. He said, I can't allow for you to fight. And he embraces Abdul Fadl Abbas. He said, I'm sorry, there's no way. You are the flag bearer of the army. You are my back. You are my pillar. I cannot allow for you to go and fight. And as they embraced one another, they heard calling and screaming from the children of Hussein. Oh, our father, the thirst of Kermana is killing us. 
Abdul Fadl Abbas, he looks toward Allah He says, please, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, help me min ursa. Oh my master, please allow for me to go. Please give me permission. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam said, okay, I will give you permission on one condition. And that is that you do not go and fight because if you go and fight, you will be killed and there's no one with me. Why don't you go toward the river Euphrates, see if the army of Omar bin Saad has a little bit of mercy on you, let them give you a little bit of water, bring it back to my children, you go and you do that. <coughs> and it is said that at this moment, Tabil Fadl al-Abbas says, no problem. He goes into the tent, he puts on his armor, he wears his helmet, he takes his spear, he takes a vessel of water, and then he goes into the tent, and I want you all to take yourselves to where Kemba for just one moment. Abu al and Abbas, the hope of the women and the children, enters into the tent. All of them, they surround him and they say, Oh, Abu al and Abbas, are you also going to go and fight? When anyone goes, they don't come back. Are you also not going to come back? He looks towards Sakaina and says, Oh, Sakaina, don't worry. I'm going to bring you water. One of the narration states that when Abu al and Abbas exits the tent, all of the children, they're running behind him and they're calling out, Ya Am, Ya Am al and Oh, my uncle, the thirst is killing us. Please go and bring us water. Sakaina, she looks to all of her cousins. She looks to all of her sisters and brothers and she says, don't worry, my uncle Abbas, she always takes care of me. When I ask him for anything, he always delivers. I promise he's going to deliver his stuff. Abdul Fadl Abbas, he embraces Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He gets on top of his horse. He begins to ride toward the Euphrates. And you know what the narration states? That when he begins to ride toward the river Euphrates, the army of Amr ibn Sa'd, they begin to call out that, oh no, this is Abdul Fadl. This is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do not allow for him to reach the Euphrates. So the Imam alayhi salam, Abdul Fadl Abbas, he begins to go and approach the river Euphrates. He has a spear in his right hand. And as he's approaching, it is said that the right wing of the army, Abdul Fadl Abbas moves the spear and everyone from the army moves. Then he moves to the left and everyone from the left moves. And they part, the tradition states that the, that the army of Amr al Sa'd, they part like the river parts from Musa until he reaches the river Euphrates. He looks down at that water. He looks back at the camp of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He sees the women, he sees the children. They're all watching what is going to happen to their uncle. He has that flag in his hand and he goes down to the water. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he leans down, he picks up some water, he's also thirsty, he's also tired, he's been bringing back bodies from the morning until this moment, he picks up that water and he brings it to his mouth and he calls out, Ya Nafsmin Ba'd al-Husayn Hun. He says, oh self, how can I drink water when my brother Hussein is more thirsty than I? And then at this moment it is said that he goes and he takes that vessel of water, he fills it up, he gets back on that horse, he raises the flag and Sukaina says, look, oh, I told you, the flag is returning back. My uncle is going to return back soon. When all of a sudden it is said that a man comes and he strikes up in front of the boss, his right hand, he calls that I swear to God if you cut off my right hand that I will continue to defend the religion of Allah and I will continue to defend my brother Abba Abdullah and at that moment the flag falls a little bit Sakaina says to her Zainab what is happening to her my uncle Abbas at this moment another man comes and he severs the left hand of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. At this moment, it is said that that water begins to gush forth. The flag falls completely to the ground. Sakaina is saying, oh my auntie, what is happening to my uncle Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? And at this moment, my friends, the most, the most epic moment of the tragedy takes place. So please forgive me for narrating it, but I'll narrate all of the details on the 10th of Muharram on the day of Ashura. It is stated that Hurmala bin Kahir, he takes an arrow which pierces the right eye of Abu al al Abbas. Another man comes and he takes a dagger which strikes the head of Abu al al Abbas. At that moment he falls down from his horse. 
but usually when someone falls down from their horse, they have their hands to protect them. But Abu al Akbar didn't have any hands, so he falls flat on his face. He calls out, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, alayka bin salam. Oh my master, my last farewell on you. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he gets on top of his horse. He goes and he rushes toward his brother up in Fadl al Abbas. He goes and he approaches him. He alights from his horse. He takes his head. His face is covered in his own blood. He begins to wipe those eyes that have been pierced with an arrow. That other eye that's been, that's been covered in dust. And he says, oh my dear brother, tell me what is your last wish. Tell me what is your last will. How can I be in two service in these last moments? Do you know what I've been up on then? He says, oh my master, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, please don't take my body back toward the tent. Because I would have disappointed Sukaina. All the children they saw me as their home. Don't take me back toward the death. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He picks up the flag and he takes the horse of Abdul Fadl al Abbas back toward the tent. When the flag is raised, all of the children raise. When the flag is raised, all of the women's raise. They come and they say that our brother, our uncle, our cousin, he's returning. But as he gets closer and closer, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is the one holding that flag. And as they get closer, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is the one bringing the horse of Abdul Fadl al Abbas. It is said that Zainab, she runs toward the imam. She says, Oh, Abba Abdullah, what happened to my brother Abbas? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam doesn't know what to say, so you know what he does. He goes toward the tent and he pulls out the pillar, the entire tent falls, and he said, That's our army now. We are without Abbas, we are without water, without, we're without a flag bearer, we're without any hope. And oh, Zainab, in one hour, my head will be severed from my body, and you will be watching when that takes place. From this grief and this tear, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of the door to our desire by the Prophet Abbas, the hold for the women and the children, we also allow for him to be our hold. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins by our love for Hussein and his family. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Wa'ala Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from Muhammad and Wa'ala Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our lives to resemble the life of Muhammad and Wa'ala Muhammad and our death to resemble the death of Muhammad and Wa'ala Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for us to emanate the qualities of loyalty and bravery and courage like that of our community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the opportunity to visit the holy city of Karbala in this life and attain the shafa'a of our master of the same in this life. Allah ma'zakna ziyawah to the same in dunya, the shafa'a to the same in the akhara. As-salamu ala muhammad wa ala al-fahim. Allah ma'zakna ziyawah to the same in the akhara.